Let me get started. <coughs> so many of you guys know the name Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, Douglass has a great quote, and he says, it's easier to build strong children than to repair a broken men. So think about that for a second. It's easier to build strong children than to repair a broken men. And we know in our industry that there's a lot of focus on building stronger children, more equipped children, better skilled children, better work ethic in our business, familiarity with the trades, and that is all good work. We should double it. We should keep doing that and double it. Uh, I'm involved in many initiatives with that. It's great work, and it needs to be done. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about the next generation. We're going to talk about this generation. And we're going to talk about the people that are in our companies right now who are the underserved and the underemployed and probably are floating right around that line of poverty or below. And it's not just, they're not just in our companies, they're also applying at all of our companies on a rotating basis. And they're in and out of employment constantly. We're going to dive in on this generation. And what I want to do is ask ourselves what we can do to tackle this idea of poverty. The idea of poverty and the working poor is, is plaguing our nation. Uh, there's approximately 14% of people that are in this category of underemployed or in poverty in the United States. And it's a, it's a, big, it's a big issue. And for our industry, I think it's a particularly relevant issue. My name is Damon Young. I'm with Mahaney Ripping Company. And I'm married to my wonderful wife, Kate. We've got five children, and I've been at Mahaney for nine years, and workforce development for me is personal. I used to be in ministry, and I have a heart for people. I was the worst when we were smaller, and I doubled and did HR as well. I was the worst HR manager of all time, and I just wanted to hire everybody and just offer to help them, and, and uh, it was terrible. And uh, as our company's grown, uh, we've, we've grown with the ability to have a team of people that are working on that, and it's great. But I do have a heart for it. The other reason I'm interested in the topic is because now in my role in, in head of sales and development, uh, we can't produce anything. I'm not putting on your guys' drugs. Uh, other people that work for us are. And we can't grow like we want to grow if we're not committed to workforce development and building up. And we don't have time to wait for the next generation. How many openings do you guys have in your companies right now? It's, the high school programs, like I said, they're good, but they're not going to help us today. And so what I want to talk about is restoring broken people. And I want to ask ourselves the question why we might be uniquely qualified to do this work. So why is the construction industry uniquely qualified to tackle poverty? I would contend that there's two reasons more than that, but we're going to focus on two. One is because we have vision. People in the construction industry don't see things as broken. They see them as yet to be fixed. People in the construction industry don't say, that's impossible. Whenever you go to someone in the construction industry and you say, that's impossible, what happens? I mean, we kind of get, a, we kind of get excited. We go, yeah, right. I'll show you. And our companies thrive on this idea and this belief of vision, of seeing something restored. And if you look at the definition of vision, it's simply the faculty or state of being able to see, the act or power of imagination, mode of seeing or conceiving. Do we possess that in the construction industry? Do we possess the ability to see? Do we possess the ability to see something broken and see it as restored? Because this can be participatory if you want. Do you, David? I, I think you do. You guys do amazing work. You do it every single day. Every single day you guys make the impossible possible. You take something broken and you make it restored. You take something that's yet to be and you make it so. It's in your DNA. You are uniquely qualified to tackle this issue and everyone in the construction industry is. The other reason why I think that we're uniquely qualified to tackle this is that we darn well should be motivated. The workforce demands in front of us are real. Our companies are not going to grow at the rate that the, any of us want them to grow. We're not going to be able to produce and hit our long-term goals with the workforce that's in front of us. Not to mention the production on the jobs that we're on right now. There's 10 to 20% of your workforce, at least I know there is in ours, 
that is always in that rotating cycle. We've got good superintendents, we've got good foremen, we've got good journeymen and second men, but the, but the beginning labor position, that nine to 13 dollars an hour position, it's rotating. And, it, and when they're rotating, they can't be safe enough, they can't be skilled enough, they can't get down any processes, they can't be productive like we want them to, to be productive. So, let's take a moment of reflection and let's just sit on this for a second and ask ourselves, what does it feel like to make something transform? What does it feel like when you've taken something and you've made it, somebody said, you can't do that, and then you drive by it now, every, you know, every once in a while you go, I did that. How does that feel? So just take a second and just dive in on that. Think of a project or something you were involved in that you transformed, you were a part of it, and you're freaking proud of it. <laughs> you love it. for me was the Kansas Coliseum. It sat there and it was, it was uh, you know, vacant forever and it was just getting worse and worse and worse. I went to concerts there as a kid, I went to Wings games as a kid, I remembered it being a vibrant place and I thought uh, I wanted it to do something, you know, and when I saw that people were thinking about developing it, and I, and I remember, also I like to do big roofing projects, right? So we have imagination. You guys do this in your business, you're driving around, you go, I'm gonna do that someday. I'm gonna do that job someday. I'm gonna do this job someday. You see an open field, you go, we're gonna develop that someday. You guys do that too, I'm sure. And I would drive by that, and I would drive by the Kansas Coliseum, and I would tell myself, I'm gonna roof that someday. I know that's a really old building, I guarantee it needs a new roof. As soon as somebody does something with it, I'm gonna roof it. And then found out who the developers were, called on them, presented a good scope of work, they accepted it, and then we roofed it. Meanwhile, the general contractor is inside completely demoing the place. And it was crazy to watch the old signage come down and, and, and the, the seating come out and, and the blocks where the seating is that being cut out and just getting completely changed. And you guys know what's there now. It's NIAR, and they're, they're doing some of the most advanced testing <laughs> Uh, in the world. An empty building to a testing center that is state of the art in the entire world. All because of vision. All because they were motivated, they have vision, and they transformed something. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is why don't we take that same passion, that same fire, and why don't we apply it to people the same way we do projects? And I would contend that there's a few reasons. So if we're saying, why are we not uniquely qualified to do it? Maybe we're saying things like, well, isn't that what churches are for? Isn't that what government's for? Isn't that what these other groups are for? We're not social services. We're trying to get a job done. Fair enough. Those are fair arguments. But I think there's other reasons that are a little deeper of why we're, we're considering that we're not uniquely qualified to tackle it. We've tried it and it hurts. We've misdiagnosed it and we really like to start things and finish them. Right? We'll talk about that more in a second. But we like to start things and we like to finish them. We don't fully understand poverty. It's not our main deal. We're trying to work on it. We're trying to dig in on it. And we just don't quite understand how to make it better. But then I think the big one that hits us right in the gut is that we've tried it and we failed. As a matter of fact, we've been diving in on this for now several years, and our success rate is terrible. For every 10 that you invest in, maybe one. It hurts to see those other guys get so close. And <coughs> So let's dive in on this one for a second. I want you to think about what's a time that you invested in someone at work and they let you down? Somebody that was in poverty, someone that was coming up in the ranks, 
and you said, man, I'm going to make this guy my project, I'm going to invest in him, we're going to turn his life around, and not just for him, but for his kids and his kids' kids. We're doing this, and you believed it, and you went after it. And I know anyone in our industry has that person that they saw, they had a heart for, they invested in, maybe you did it directly, maybe you did it through someone in your company, but you gave them that second, that third, that fourth chance just because you believed in them. You wanted to see it work out. You knew they had potential, but it didn't. So just take a second and reflect on that. What's that person's name? What do they look like? What are they doing now? that stick to mind are the guys that uh, came through criminal justice and and we gave them more chances and and uh, but you need to have a stern accountability measure as well and you, you push back and forth and then something happens and they get it and then they start getting promoted and then uh, they run up against something and we'll talk about what these things they run up against are in a minute but they run up against something where they run with the same group of people you know, John Maxwell talks about the law of the inner circle. And the, the key to the law of the inner circle is that you pick the circle. <laughs> when you're growing up in poverty, your circle picks you. And when the people default to that circle, how many of us know that almost always it sucks them back in? And so as we think about these people where we've had failures, it sucks. It hurts. And that's part of the reason that we, we, we shy away from it. The other two reasons we've misdiagnosed it and we like to start and finish things, I think really taps into something that we can jump in on and do a little bit of learning on. Because even if we can get the gumption to try again, you guys have all heard the saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. And we love technical work. So there's a, there's a principle, I got this from the Kansas uh, Leadership Center, that talks about distinguishing technical versus adaptive work. Has anyone heard those terms before? A few of you. So technical work, the solution is clear. The problem is clear. Whose work it is, it's done by an expert or someone in authority. The type of work is very efficient. It's on a very structured timeline. The expectations are that it's going to be resolved. And your attitude is you're confident and you're skilled and you're going to get it done. This is the type of work that we do every day. This is our side of the column, right? This is who we are. We're really good at it. The other side is adaptive work, which the solution, not clear. The problem, not clear. Whose work it is? It's many, many stakeholders across spread out. And they're definitely not necessarily an expert. The type of work, is you have to act experimentally. You don't know if it's going to work or not. You're going to try it, you're going to hope it works. And even when it fails, it's going to work a little bit because you tried something. And then the timeline's long term that way, and your expectation is that you only make progress. It's not finished. So if we bind together here in this room and we tackle poverty, we'll never be finished. This is a clearly an adaptive problem that we will never be done working on. So you have to just take it in and go, wait a second, I'm getting ready to tackle a problem that will never be finished, that will never be solved. And you gotta get your mind right that you're focused on just making progress. And you have to not get caught up on your hurt and your pain. And you have to think about just being curious. I wonder if this will work. I wonder if we tried this, if it would make a difference. And that curiosity is a fire that will start to burn. Studies say that when you dive in on this technical and adaptive work, that what happens is when you misdiagnose this, when you tackle an adaptive problem and you call it technical, two things happen. Work avoidance, 
or you just keep treating it like a technical problem. So when we come across an adaptive problem, what we generally start to do is we say, I've come across a problem, the solution is not clear, the problem is not clear, I'm not sure whose work it is, I have to act experimentally, I don't know what I'm gonna get done, wait, I might never get done, and then we, so that's daunting. So we do work avoidance. I think I'll work on something else. <laughs> I think I'll go over here and do this instead. I'll focus on making this part of my company better. I'll focus on working on investing in this person who picks up everything I'm laying down. And we really focus on work avoidance. We do anything but that. Anyone else relate to that? <laughs> I'm all over that one. The other thing we do is we just say, you know what? Don't understand it. I'm just going to treat keep treating it like a technical problem. And we, we establish a solution. This is the answer to poverty. We establish the, the problem. I know exactly what the problem is. We say we're the expert, or we go find the expert. We establish a timeline, we create an expectation, and then what happens? It doesn't work. <laughs> we get frustrated. We don't call it what it was. What it was was an experiment that we tried, and hopefully we made progress. But if we treat it technically, we still won't actually get to the root cause. So this right here is something to really dive in on within our organizations and within our, within our own minds. Is are we treating it like a technical problem or like an adaptive problem? <clears throat> so the good news is we're not starting from scratch. <laughs> There's lots of people who have been working on this for many, 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 many years. Uh, since the outset of time, people have been talking about this problem. Since modern day economies, people get left behind. When, when God gave us choice, people started choosing bad decisions pretty quick. And so this is, we've been working on this for a long time and we're not starting from scratch. And I, when, in preparation for this topic, I've, I've had a, the pleasure of diving in on lots of really cool books and learning the work that people are doing. And uh, there's some exciting work out there if you start to dive in. First, we need to get our mind around really thinking about the term poverty and rethinking about how we think about it. I think that most of us, back to technical and adaptive, think that poverty is technically not having enough money. I think that's where we default to. That's where we put it in our minds. If they had more money, they wouldn't be in poverty. I'm a person who came up out of poverty, and even when I got some money, I still had characteristics and traits that I had to relearn. So I think that there's some things we need to get our minds around. It does not matter what socioeconomic level that you're at, but I promise you that it's about more than the lack of money. And we all know this in our businesses, because we've hired the guy at $10 an hour, and we've watched them go from 11 to 12 to 13 to 14 to 15 to 16 to 17 to 20 to 25, and then boom, a peer group problem. Boom, an addiction problem. Boom, a lack of man money management problem that takes them out. It's happened to some of us. So it's more than about money. It's multifaceted. It's often multi-generational. And we all have aspects of poverty to overcome. And I think that's kind of the hard work. That's the work that we got to kind of loosen up around and just be like, okay, this isn't some, this isn't a up and down problem. We're up, they're down. Right? This is a problem that we're all in. In our, in our, if we think about our parents and we think about our grandparents and we think about our kids and our kids' kids, we think about the way that these areas, these multifaceted areas, affect each kid and each generational level. And so let's walk through these real quick and dig in on what some of these are. This is from a book called A Framework for Understanding Poverty. I cited at the end uh, by Ruby Payne. And she says that there's, these are the essential areas that, that she has identified in her research. Financial, it's obviously a part of it. Emotional, mental health spiritual, and what she calls a future story, which we'll come back to, physical, support systems, relationships and role models, knowledge of hidden rules. So financial, 
There's another book that I read in this process called When Helping Hurts. And When Helping Hurts contends that these three areas are what keep people in financial poverty. Is that they're not earning a living wage, they don't know how to manage money, and they don't have a vision for accumulating net worth. Or in other words, savings that will get them through the next thing that happens. We think about those things as we learn about money and we learn about making it from one you know, a problem to the, to the next solution. But people who are coming up in poverty, they don't have sometimes that nest egg. And it's not because they haven't earned money, it's because they have not planned for it, they haven't saved it. So these are areas of financial. Emotional, mental health, physical, these are somewhat self-explanatory. I'm not an expert on them, I'm not gonna go into them. But we know these are factors that influence poverty. Support systems, this is big. And this is where we have to dig in on, on who, who's around them. Who, who are the systems or the families or the churches or the structures around them that they have identified with that, that are there to go back to Maxwell, the, the law of the inner circle. Where, what is their inner circle? What are their support systems? Uh, I will date myself a little bit. I'll just tell you my age. Actually, I turn 42 next month. And I remember, and we all, if, if you're in my age time period or, or past it, you'll, you remember when you're 25 and the people you're hanging out with and the things that they're doing, and then whenever you're 30, and then whenever you're 35, and then you show up one day to something when you're 35, and one of your friends is still acting like they're 25. And you, and you just realize, you just kind of look around, and you kind of have a moment where you go, this isn't my inner circle anymore. Anyone else have that moment? <laughs> and, it, and, and it's not, this doesn't mean they're not your friend, doesn't mean they're not you know, someone that you'll talk to for the rest of your life, it just means they're not your inner circle. They're not gonna actually be the one that's gonna support you. Relationships and role models, the, the positive influence of, of a, a father or a adult, uh, a grandparent, a relative, a pastor, a coach, uh, a mentor, Who's had some of those good ones? I've, I've had them. And if we don't have them, we don't know what that is. The knowledge of hidden rules. This is one that I found really interesting. This is talking about how at each socioeconomic level, there are hidden rules that we become used to, accustomed to, and we don't know how to transition from one to the next without someone showing us. So an example that they give in the book is noise. If you go into an environment that is a, a home of someone who is in a, at the welfare or poverty level traditionally, there's going to be multiple conversations happening at multiple times. The TV is going to be on or music is going to be on and it's going to be an environment that's noisy. And in order to get attention, you, you shout it across the room or you say it across, you know, you, you don't go have a conversation, you just say stuff. And it all kind of blends together in this noise. So a hidden rule of poverty is that it's okay to be noisy and how you get attention is by being louder. As opposed to leave it to Beaver and the dad says, B, would you come in my study and I'd like to visit with you for a moment. And then you sit down in a quiet environment and you have a conversation about a specific thing. Another hidden rule is the way we use language. The, the, as you transition in socioeconomic groups, the words that you use, you use more words and you use more specific words. Less they, them, us, and more specifically who you're talking about and what exactly you're talking about. So when you find people applying at your company at the bottom level, has anyone else had this experience where someone will say, they said this about such and such and they give a whole sentence to you, a whole paragraph, and you don't know what they're talking about. Who? Where? What? And you have to drill down and ask questions. That's a hidden rule. So you have to learn these, and generally they're taught. You're not going to read them in a book, generally. Someone's going to say, hey man, let me show you. Everybody has that experience where you're getting ready to go into a big meeting or something, and you had a, uh, someone who was showing you, and you're a little nervous, and they go, let me take this one. I'll show you. And then you go, oh, that was easy. Well, it was easy for them because someone showed them and they'd done it a hundred times. If they wouldn't have shown you, you wouldn't have known. <laughs> not that you can't figure it out, not that you can't get better at it, but it is a hidden rule. So these are all fascinating to me. A ton of work here, 
you can dive in and drill down on each of these within your companies. Maybe you have an intake that helps people identify these. Probably you don't. I know we didn't <coughs> do this, and now we're trying to adapt one that helps us get a snapshot. What Ruby Payne talks about in education and in uh, in the workforce is that do, doing some sort of an assessment where, you, where people can grade themselves and you can grade them and you can talk about the disparity of where they're at versus where they think they're at and then provide resources to them to make progress on these. Understanding that it's not up to us up on, our, on, our, on our high horse saying you need this and you need that. We can relate to them and say here are areas where I'm weak and I've got some resources that have helped me. So these are the areas that, that we can dive into. And so what I want to talk about for the next few moments is really drilling down on some examples within our own company that we've done on some of these levels in some of these categories. And as I do that, I want you to think about back to the aha moment of really fully diagnosing this situation we need to realize what's happening in this stat here. Here is the number of words expressed. This is the economic group. This is the affirmative statements and then the negative statements. So people in the welfare or in poverty state hear about 13 million words. Working class, double. Professional, almost double. Then, the amount of negative or positive to negative, people in poverty or welfare are hearing one positive word for every two negative. Middle class, the opposite. Two affirmatives to one negative. Professional environments, they're hearing six positives to one negative. So we need to loosen up a little bit and just think about that people that are coming into our organizations, if they've come out of poverty, do not believe us. They do not believe that we can do it. We believe that the impossible is possible. They do not. We believe that if you keep working, you keep grinding, good things will happen. They do not. They fundamentally disagree with us at a guttural level that they can't even express. And we're talking to them about opportunity and timelines and progress, and they do not know what we're talking about. They sincerely believe that things are going to get worse. Matter of fact, they're waiting for the next shooter to drop. They're waiting for the next negative thing to happen in their life. And so we have to, there's nothing we can do about this to start, but we better darn sure just think about it and understand it and accept it as a variable. Because what do we do? We kind of judge them. Man, what's wrong with, what's wrong with Steve? Kind of got a bad attitude. He's not really a go-getter. He doesn't really, he didn't really get motivated to go conquer the world. And the reason is he, he's not been taught that he can't. So, lessons from the trenches, some Mahaney stories around hope in a future, Team Luke, and I am a champion. We've done some things. We didn't know about this research whenever we did these things. We just knew that people generally had a, an air of miscontent and negativity. And so we started doing things to try to reverse that. One of the things we did was we interjected one Bible verse. And it's Jeremiah 29, 11, and it says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's a rough paraphrase, if you're a Bible expert. And it was amazing what happened. It was amazing. People started to spread that. People started to put it in places. People started to uh, talk about, generally, uh, <coughs> plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What's your hope? What's your future? What's your plans? Over, and this is at six months and a year and a year and a half. Just interjecting this into orientation, interjecting this into a leadership meeting, interjecting this into a safety meeting, uh, change something. Remember that chart where it said spiritual slash future story? That's, this is hitting on that point, that people generally are not believing that they have a positive outcome, a positive future. So this verse directly, directly hits that in the face and says no, Actually, you're made for a purpose, and there's positive things ahead. Pretty deep stuff, if you've not heard it before. The other thing we did, and this is really an outcome, we didn't really do it. 
that was a byproduct of this that we saw was Team Loop. Team Loop was an example where we had someone who'd come through incarceration and they had actually worked for us multiple times. They were, Loop is the epitome of the person I'm talking about that has potential, is skilled, but makes really dumb choices. And did it over and over and over. Worked for us, I, I think he got fired two, if not three times. And would go away for a while, sometimes he'd go to jail and he'd come back. Very skilled guy, yeah, we'll give you another chance. So this last time, he came in and the hope and a future thing was going on. And he jumped in on it and he started believing it. He started coming to the leadership meetings and we noticed something, and we'll talk about those relationships and role models. He started being a relationship builder and a role model for the people around him. So the meetings were mandatory for the foreman to come to, an early morning leadership meeting. The foreman would come, they had to, but anyone else was welcome to come. So Luke's whole crew would come with him. Why? Because he was talking to them. He was building a relationship. He was, he was a positive role model. As much as I would like to say that I can personally motivate the people on Luke's crew to do that, I can't. But he can. He's in a uniquely different spot than I am. And he did it. Then, Luke tragically passed away. He was working out of town. He was in his hotel room, had a heart attack. A week later, he passed away. We told the people within our organization, hey guys, we're going to honor Luke and we're going to take the day off of the funeral. If you guys want to take the company trucks or whatever you want to do, you don't have to come, but if you want to come, then, then that's what we're going to do. So everybody, leadership, we're all heartbroken, we're sad. We talked about Luke. Luke was our hope in the future. He was doing the very thing that we were starting to dive into. And then something crazy happened. At the funeral, the workforce were approximately 100 people. Approximately 50 of them self-organized, got t-shirts made, black t-shirts, and they said, hashtag Team Loop. And on the back of them was Jeremiah 2911. They all show up to the funeral. They all attend and pay their respects. And the culture that was starting to brew amongst those men was transformative. And it's still going to this day. And it goes up and it goes down. But two things happen there. A relationship and role model appear with a positive future story. So we can think that's a one-off. But if we start we're back to technical and adaptive, there are some technical things we can do. And so let's dive in on what some of those might be. Oh, sorry, I forgot one. The I am a champion. This is the same thing. So Mark Bold, our owner, at our last company meeting two or two meetings ago it's a some you may have seen it but it's a coach before a game and he's pacing back and forth and he's talking about when we face obstacles what do we do we overcome them why and then he'd ask the the football players why and they would say i'm a champion and then he would present another solution or another problem and then the solution and the cadence is just building. And he'd say, why? And they'd say, I am a champion. And then he would present another problem and another solution. And he'd say, we're going to do it. And he'd say, why? And they'd say, I am a champion. And they, by the end, you know how those things go. They're flipping tables over. They're running out there. And of course, they're going and winning the game. Why? Because they're a champion. They had a positive role model that was encouraging them. And he was telling them a positive future story. And he was motivating them. So why can't we do that in our workforces? So now, now that's a part of our company meetings. Mark comes out in our, our, our monthly safety meeting, and he says, hey, morning, fellas, who am I? That's, it's Monday mornings usually, so sometimes like, oh, I'm a champion, you know. But most of the time, he's like, no, that's not good enough. Who am I? I'm a champion. And now it's part of the culture. Now, whenever you see a guy on a job, it's pretty common, just happened today, where you go, hey, what's going on? What's going on, champion? Now it's becoming part of the culture. So as good as that is, and we're proud of that work that we're doing at Mahaney, and it's, like I said, it's not about the next generation, it's about this generation. All the work for the next generation, keep doing it, double it, let's all get involved. But this generation, they're working for me right now. 
And we did that, and it really is mainly one aspect. So I want to introduce something to you. This is from Joseph Granny, and it's the six uh, spheres of influence, or the six focuses of influence, or ways that you influence people. <coughs> Go back and put it here, and I'll come back. So if you follow this chart, motivational level, the ability level, personal, social, structural. Joseph Granny would contend that we love the number one button. <laughs> personal motivation. Let's do it. Mike's here. Mike could give us a speech that would be personally motivating, and it'd probably be a freaking awesome speech. It's one button. I can give one speech, and it'd be awesome. Everybody here has probably given a guy a speech, and he got personally motivated. And that lasts for a little bit, but it's not quite enough. Joseph Granny would contend that you need more. If you only motivate someone and you don't give them skills and tools, they're going to get frustrated. They're going to go, Damon's full of crap. He said I could do this, and I can't. And he's right. He can't. He but believes he can, but he can't. A good point on that, Damon, and one of the things we're discussing internally with, with APC and other partners on this image campaign is be careful what you ask for. We go and we, we promote the great things that we're doing in the construction design community, and we start to fill the pipeline of the younger generation, and companies start to hire, but they don't follow through right. with the continuing process, that that woman or man are going to go back to whatever institution they were at, whatever school, and tell that principal, that administrator, or whoever, just like you said, right. that industry is full of crap. Right. They're, not, they're not practicing what they're preaching. Right. And so it's a heavy burden we're taking on to sit there and, and project ourselves, but we better follow through with what we say, not practice what we preach. Well, there's good articles about that, about just mention and vision statements and how they're actually terribly detrimental if you adopt them and you don't do them. If you talk about it but you're not about it, you're done. And so the same thing happened here. If we personally motivate someone, that's a good button. We need to hit that button. But we also need to provide them skills. Then social. What can we do to motivate people as a group? And then how do we give people abilities as a group? And then design rewards and demand accountability structurally, systematically. For example, we've added a term of innovation in some of our core values. And we were talking internally as a leadership team, and then we're going, when do we pause to allow people to tell us their innovative ideas? We're in commercial roofing. If the weather's good, we're going. And I asked the owner, Mark, I said, when do we give people an opportunity, and who are they supposed to say it to? And he's just, and he said, you're right. You know, we're, he's not going to, as much as Mark loves them and wants their idea, or I do, or Heidi does, are we really asking them to come and talk to us when they go back to what we just said? They don't really, haven't heard a lot of positive words. And they're going to go and when the crews are getting ready to get out and everybody in the truck is getting paid and they're on the clock, they're going to say, hey, I have an idea. It's not going to work out. So structurally, we have to shift. We have to allow a place for that innovative idea to happen. Same thing's true when you're trying to fight poverty and you're trying to change people's belief systems and their attitudes. Another thing Joseph Greeny talks about is, uh, I blanked out on, on what he said. Um, <coughs> it'll come back to me. Um, so we have to focus on these six areas and try to hit more of them. None of us are going to get awesome at all six. But the contention would be that we could at least do a little bit better at using more than one or two. So, key takeaway, generally speaking, people coming out of poverty do not have a positive view of the future. And that impact is huge. It's, it's huge on their life and it's huge on our organizations. So what, think back to the Mahaney stories and some of the things that we did. And let's think about some of the other buttons that we hit. So we added influence, or area three, up here leading the group. So that, that positive future story was infused into a person he was personally motivated. He was given a little bit of training, leadership training, leadership books, and then he was in a position where he was the ringleader of his guys. Anybody who had ex-gang members as part of their, their groups or part of their organizations, these guys are the best leaders. <laughs> they are used to pulling people together, motivating them, and then holding them accountable to go accomplish a task. 
So we had somebody who was a peer talking to him. So that's a social motivation, and then he was taking them to learn. Another thing, this barrier is not in the presentation, but another barrier is that people believe in this state of poverty that someone is going to take their spot. So if I'm tra training David, and David is saying, and, and I trained him too well, he's going to take my job. So they're very protective. They're protective of their institutional knowledge and their skills, and they're very careful who they share it with. Anyone seen that in action? Because they think, if I train him too well, he's going to take my spot. And that's part of the culture to say, no, if we all grow together, if you can train your replacement, you'll always have a job. And think about this, even when you get older. And we saw the numbers about our workforce and how many of them are 50 to 60. What are, the, what are those guys going to do? Well, if they, can re if they can train their replacement, we got a spot for them. So another thing we did is we added the leadership training, which would be number four. And then we saw a significant improvement. Our retention, back to, back to me being the worst HR manager in the history of mankind, our, our uh, retention now is remarkably better. I remember earlier last year, I said, uh, hey, Morgan, how many people are, uh, how many people do we have in the 90 days range? She said, one. What? And when I did it, we always had many people in that less than 90 days range. Because as soon as you lost someone, you had to get someone else back. And I'm just going through. We go, it's like anything, it goes up and down. But we've seen significant success with this. The other thing we've seen is the barriers that pe keep people from advancing or leading, they're starting to be, come to the forefront. So we've gotten people to a certain point, and now it's time. Luke is not with us anymore. I need to know who the next Luke is. And so this, this piece of a peer leading, we're starting to see the fear. We're starting to see the, back to diagnosing the situation. We're seeing the things come to the forefront that are keeping somebody from taking that step. They've got a little bit of the skills. They've got a little bit of the motivation. They, they're perfectly capable. They're just a little bit afraid. So now we're saying, what, how do we rally around that person to, to mentor them, to help them leave, knowing that they're going to lead a lot better than any of us. Them doing the work is going to be a lot better than us doing that work. And then the first thing we did was actually area number five, design rewards and demands and demand accountability. So because we had a rotating cast of characters in that bottom 20% of our workforce, we still needed them. They were the people that were sweeping up the parking lot. They were the people that were doing some of the tear-off work. And we needed them. You just needed warm bodies. And so if someone is going through that and they're presenting problems to you and they're not having good attendance, then we're diving into, uh, well, I'll give you that third or fourth chance just because I need you. I know that what the handbook says, but just show up anyway. Anyone else guilty of that? And so as that happens, and that lack of accountability happens, then that shifts the culture. When Heidi Perez, our COO, came on, the first thing she did before any of this other stuff, as we talked about, put in a system of accountability and stick to it. And Mark and I were terrified, because we thought, well, we'll lose everybody. Not everybody, but this quadrant we're talking about. And the exact opposite happened. We lost a few, but they probably weren't going to work out anyway, for whatever reason. So. This system of accountability, so at that point in our organization, and I'm not trying to say like, we're up here, we are learning. We're acting experimentally, we're curious, we know we're never gonna be done, but we are hitting buttons on this personal motivation. We're doing a little bit with the skills training. We are trying to harness the social motivation and even social and peer learning. And we do have a system of rewards that demands accountability. Changing the environment, that's slowly happening. But I don't, I don't, I have tackled and really dived into how we would do that. So, still, it's how you go from one aspect and you try to focus others. So, what I'd like you to do is just take a couple minutes to reflect on and think about when you think about these areas of influence, what areas of influence have you tried in your organization? What's your go to move? Is it a class? Do you go to, let's teach them some technical skills? Or do you go to personal motivation? 
What do you guys do? So just think about, just take a minute to think about areas of influence that you've exercised. And I remember what Joseph, the other thing Joseph Greeny said is that if Maxwell said leadership is influence, what Joseph Greeny is saying is that influence is only changing behavior. So th these are influencers to change behavior, is Joseph Greeny's point. So as we can all attest, this is hard work. It's hard work to think differently and to not think technically all the time and think adaptively and to just accept and be resigned to the fact that we're not going to win, we're not going to complete the project. But I would argue that if we can shift our thinking a little bit and we can start to look at people the way we look at projects, that we will dramatically improve our efficiency of our organizations and we, can, we won't fix our workforce demands, but we'll make progress on them. And it won't be with the future generation, per se. It'll be with the generation that's working for us right now. So why is the construction industry uniquely qualified to tackle poverty? I think it's because we have vision. We have the can-do attitude. We're motivated. And I think deeper still, back to structural, on those spheres of influence, we have teams in our organization that focus significantly on just human resources and training. I'm looking up around the room and you chose to come to this workshop for a reason. You can have two or three or four or five employees in some of your organizations that are thinking about exactly this. And I believe that we can learn to, we can learn to think in an adaptive manner. I think that the technical and adaptive piece is something we need to dive in on. And I think we can learn it, especially when our forehead starts to hurt from banging against the wall over and over and over. <laughs> and whenever that work avoidance, we've gotten bored and we've done everything else we can think about, we'll come back to the table and we'll go, I guess I can learn. I guess I'll try to think adaptively. And it's hard, but we can do it. The other thing is that we can experiment with using new areas of influence. It's a long race. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. We can try different things, and we have, you have executive teams, and you can say, you know what, this quarter or this year, let's try one thing. We're really good at this area and this area of influence. What if we just added one more? Don't try to do all six. We can do that. We're good at planning. We like game charts, <laughs> right? So we can say, well, how about we spread out these spheres of influence and slowly implement them over time? The other thing is that we're used to collaborating. And back to how I started this presentation about when we talked about do churches do this, or does government do this, or do social services do this? Yes, they do. And they actually are uniquely qualified for aspects of it. And we certainly should be partners with them. And that type of collaboration is something we're completely used to. We work across channels like that all the time in our industry. And so if we talked about a person like a project and we had all the key stakeholders of design and architecture and engineering and general contracting and subcontracting and finishing and building and maintenance. If we thought of a person that way, how could we transform not just the person, not just the family, but our organizations? Thank you guys for your time. The sources are here on the PowerPoint for some of the books that I reference. And I'd like to take, 
uh, just a couple minutes we have left and see if you guys have any questions or if there's anything that you want to talk about. I had a situation that came up about a month ago. I had a 35 year old, 35 year employee in the 60s. He had had words, and I thought the guys were going to come to fisticuffs. Mm -hmm. I really thought they should say, but he was arguing with a younger guy who was just a stick in the mud. I mean, he just didn't want to do what his superintendent wanted him to do. He wanted his superintendent to ask him how he could do it, or something along that line. They just, they just were oil and water. They were not going to listen to one another. How was that my way to didn't want to lose either one of them. Certainly have a lot invested in the superintendent. Certainly have about three years with the guys uh, in mid, early, early 30s. Certainly had potential. He was a leader. He was in, he was, uh, he had served our country in the armed forces, came back. But he's still just as stubborn as I'll get out. Just stubborn. How's that my way to him? I called a good friend of mine. I don't know if you've ever heard of this kind of program. It's called Employee Assistance Plan. And I, for a dollar and a quarter an hour, or a dollar and a quarter per employee per month. So I have 60 employees. It costs me $90 a month to have this outside counselor meet with these guys that, on a one-to-one -one basis. He can go in on my dime. 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock, whatever he wants. Those guys make the appointments, but I, I have made it a mandatory that they met with that guy and tried to resolve their differences independently or they couldn't get back to work. That yeah, worked. I can say I had a little bit of success. That's my only success story yeah. I can say for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it gave me an out. Pulled me away from the situation, which I was grateful for. I've known these guys too well. I was I was ready to fire them both. You know, I, I know my I know circumstances where my father's generation would have said it's been nice to know them both. Get you're out of here. I didn't want to lose either one of them. And so far, it really had benefits for to the superintendent because he realized he was communicating in a way that was derogatory and. I mean, they were swearing and carrying on, mm -hmm. but it was, it was a mess. The other guy still hadn't quite come around yet. He had his second meeting out of the three. The superintendent had three out of the three. As long as they went to three deal, he got a good recommendation from the counselor, it worked. So I'm sorry, they really didn't maybe <coughs> go along with a lot. No, it does. I think with that. It gave me another tool in my bag to help help in that situation. I think that speaks to This. And so the, a lot of these uh, emotional and mental mm -hmm. and physical and even a lot of these things we're not uniquely qualified to do. Uh, if some of you guys have seen that uniquely qualified high energy quadrant, yeah. the was it upper right is where you're supposed to focus, uniquely qualified with high energy. What we decided at Mahaney was that we're uniquely qualified to have high energy for financial because for their employer and spiritual future story and kind of this one relationships role models support systems we're not uniquely qualified in this 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 or this so impact <coughs> is that what you're talking about impact yeah and, and you know, the counselor was really trying to teach them how to deal with anger management yeah yeah that's that yeah question. getting having outside resources that you can plug them into to understand this person it's just like when you came across something on a building and you knew what the solution was, when you came across that situation, you could see what the problem was. They didn't know how to do conflict resolution or control their anger, so you connected with that resource. What's the definition of poverty? Lack of resources. What so was you, the name of the group again? The, your counseling group? Um, here in Wichita, it's called Parker Counseling. 
we do one similar e called e M e impact. A, yeah. impact. Impact, I think E M P A C. Yeah. And that they, they do, you pay it the same uh, structure, you pay a fee, and then you can make it uh, conditional employment even situations where it's like even even uh, personal coaching or, or family or addiction or whatever it is, and say, hey, you need to go get help with that. Yeah, because we're not going to fix some of that stuff. But we can help them identify it and understand that it's just one aspect of it. Dave, right. outside of leadership training, do you, do you guys do other training to address those things? Like, do you have financial planning or things like that that you guys help them out with? Or even, like, physical is a good one, too. So that's kind of through this Back to uh, hand charts. <laughs> so this quarter is kind of the research quarter, and then next quarter we're going to try to roll out within those the ones I just said some new programs because we have not done financial literacy. Um, the only thing we did close is we did that group where we got uh, we did essentially an entrepreneurship class, and we talked about we had it. I can't remember if it lasted it lasted several months, and people came through and they learned about how to start a business, value of money, how to make a deal, how to buy something, how to pay it off, and they did a vending machine in our organization. But it wasn't how to balance your checkbook, it wasn't, uh, and we need it. And, and I think that's probably number one on our, it's pretty low hanging fruit. I mean there's, everybody needs it, they pretty much kind of know they need it. A lot of them don't use banks, they're employed you know, they're employed, or they get paid checks every week. And so putting something in front of them to help them educate them. The thing we're wrestling with with this is if we flush out the support structure, who do we roll it out to? And we're wrestling with maybe you don't roll it out to the employee. Maybe you roll it out to the employee and the family, somehow. Um, same with, uh, if we pay for health insurance, um, how do you utilize your health insurance? All the time, it happened last week. Somebody said, I went to the emergency room or the cold, and, it's, and that, that's a hidden rule. When you're sick, you don't have insurance, you go to the emergency room. Well, did you show me your insurance card? Did you, you know, I mean, and it's just, they didn't know. So no is the short answer. We're working on it is the longer answer. Have you guys got anything with that? No, it's one we've talked about because, yeah. you know, it's interesting that you talk about it. It's more than lack of money because, you know, every, I think everybody's come across people where, they get a raise and then they come back to you six months later like, oh, I need more money, I need more money. They always need more because they just don't know how to manage their personal income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Well, the last question that you can think about, and uh, my email's on there. If you want to continue the conversation, you can think about what's something we could do that can make a practical difference. What's something we could do within your company? Maybe that's a takeaway you go work on it within your company. Maybe it's something we do as a community. Maybe we offer financial literacy classes on the weekends and multiple companies go or something. You know, I don't know. So, I don't know. Think about anything actionable. Take it away with you, ponder it. And if you think of something that's cool and you want to share it, please reach out to me. I'll certainly reach out to you guys and send you guys a copy of the PowerPoint. And we'll see if we can continue the conversation and not finish, but make progress on this issue of uh, poverty and treating people like we treat our projects. So thank you.